We have a great opportunity tonight to hear from some really smart people about investing. And I'm going to get everything out of them I possibly can for your ears. So I have a question to start out for both of you. It's probably on the minds of everybody that's in this room. ISMs are heading straight south. Money growth is negative. Leading economic indicators are down 10 months in a row. Dennis, Rick, tell us, what's the probability of a recession in 2023? For me? <laughs> it's going to be a long night. <laughs> so, so I'm going to go on since 6 in the morning. Could the questions get easier from this? Or oh, yeah. They, <laughs> no, I'm going to ratchet them up. By the, way, by the way, I'll say one thing from Tony's introduction. So I did graduate at Emory. I met my wife at Emory, and she graduated. I graduated third in the business school. She graduated first. So she should be up here, not me. Woman behind the man. Yeah. Or woman in front of her. So, sorry, what was the question? So, anyway, so yeah. the, uh, listen, I, you know, I'm pretty enthusiastic about the US economy. I, you know, I think you have to put into perspective where we've come from and how we've had this explosive growth. You think about a couple of years ago, we had double digit nominal GDP. You think about this year, we're going to have, or 2022, you had nominal GDP that nobody ever thought you'd have in the, in the sixes. Listen, I think people underestimate the US economy. There's a bunch of things happening. And when people look at the high frequency data, the high frequency data is slowing. But you know, last week I thought was a great example of this. Retail sales came out, people said, my God, the retail sales number is weak. If you put it in perspective, nominal retail sales since December 2019, pre-COVID, is up 29%. 29%. Real retail sales up 19%. US economy, the base you're starting from is pretty impressive, let alone, you know, you think about the savings rate, the consumer savings, which is trending lower. But you think about what the consumer did during COVID, delevered the balance sheet, paid down credit card debt, paid down housing mortgage debt. The savings, the total aggregate savings that consumers have now is a trillion eight. We're burning about 70 billion a month but it's a trillion eight. You're starting from a level that's pretty impressive. So are we gonna go in a recession? Listen, I, you know, I've, I've learned over the years, having been through the financial crisis, having been through the 2001, 2002 recession, 1990, you need leverage to be high to create a deep recession. Otherwise, the economy has an amazing ability to recalibrate, flex, and adjust itself. And you think about, there are four parts of leverage in an economy, household, uh, financial, corporate, and government. And you think about where we are today, households pay down the leverage, the financial system has paid down the leverage, the corporate system is in pretty darn good shape. If you take all the leverage metrics, the government has the leverage. But that's a pretty good place to have it because you can tax your way out of it over time. So I don't think, the sh see the shock to the system, I think the economy, you know, could we have a shallow recession? 100%. But the place you're starting from is pretty impressive. And I think people underestimate how durable the U.S. economy is, and I, and I think you'll see that play out. Dennis, what do you think? Well, recession? I, I, I learned uh, when I was at the Federal Reserve, never give a straight answer. <laughs> 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 Always talk in vague terms and probabilities and so forth. Um, I, you know, I look at the situation and I, I agree with Rick that the starting point for the year is very strong. If we look. Uh, at the GDP numbers that came out today, 2.9%. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's above trend, that's above potential, that's a strong economy with momentum into the year. So I, I think um, as the, the Fed probably continues to raise the policy rate another, let's say, 75 basis points, 50 to 75 basis points, in this latter half of the year, you could have enough of a slowdown that it might, in retrospect, look something like a recession. But I think there's still a chance of a soft landing. Now, one of the things I advocate, nobody listens to me anymore, but I advocate <clears throat> is we, we should not just talk about the recession or a recession. There are different, different degrees of recession. And Rick says, uh, and I agree with him, a mild recession, there's a decent chance of that. But you know, my approach is to use a hurricane uh, kind of uh, system, cat one, cat two, cat three, 
blah, 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 cap five. I don't see a cap five recession in this economy. There's too many areas of strength. But a cap one recession could very well, could very well materialize in the second half. So if I put numbers on it, I would say probably a greater than 50% chance of a slowdown that is counted as a recession, but it's likely to be mild and re relatively shallow, and there is still a chance of a soft landing. Gosh, you know, over most of our working careers, which kind of Rick just took us through, I can't think of a good time that we had a category one recession. You take me back through FOMC history, what was a category one recession? Maybe the 1990 recession when it wasn't too bad? Because we've had some big category fives over the past few years. That's probably a good, <clears throat> that's probably a good one to, to think about. I would think about it in the following characteristics, and that, that is probably slow down to less than a half a percent growth, mm -hmm. but still conceivably some growth, uh, a rise in unemployment, mm -hmm. um, how much? Oh, much like what the Fed has signaled in its summary of economic projections, maybe up to four and a half percent, something like that, or perhaps a little bit more. And, um, and then ca categories like uh, industrial production and consumer activity, very, very, not depressed, but suppressed. Mm -hmm. um, th that's, that's as far as I would go, given the strength of the economy today. All right. Well, look, it's a really tough macro environment. You've got the U.S. that's slowing, which I think both Dennis and Rick agree with. It's slowing. It's coming off the boil. But China is kind of at the opposite end. They've had three years of um, lockdowns. The economy really ground to a halt, big leverage in the property sector. Rick, how do you think about investing in a world where the U.S. is kind of on a gentle slowdown and China's on the other side? So I, th I think there are a couple of things to that. I mean, the first is, I mean, people underestimate China's the second largest economy in the world. Their impact on the commodity markets is extraordinary. So, you know, as China reopens, I think people underestimate the pressure. You're still going to see pressure. You see, you look at the copper markets today, you look at the oil market, which I think is still underestimating the demand, the next derivative demand that's going to come from China. But listen, it's a, it is a really big deal that you have now what is a U.S. economy that's slowing, a European economy that's actually doing better because of the warmer weather conditions. You know, it's interesting seeing, uh, I was looking at uh, some of the earnings reports from some of the European luxury goods makers, Burberry, Richemont, LVMH, and you see the China reopening start to impact those companies in a pretty major way. See how their stocks have performed. Listen, I think China opening is a really big deal for the global economy. It's part of why I think there's ballast in the system today for why the economy can continue to grow. You think about the impact when China grows, the impact it's going to have on the European economy, how it's going to have on the emerging market economies, particularly in Asia. It's pretty dramatic. So, you know, listen, I mean, China was, you think about how the economy, U.S. economy performed when, it, when China was shut down. It performed pretty well. I think it's a pretty good, listen, I still think the U.S. economy, by and large, is a closed economy, which is a hard statement to make. But I think the U.S. economy doesn't really count on the rest of the world, but it does help when you have the second largest economy that is, uh, that is growing today. Listen, I think one of the things that's also one of the most extraordinary things that we are going to go through in investing over the next few years is how the war has impacted how people think about China and investment in China mm -hmm. and how the regionalization of supply chains are going to develop from here. So part of what's actually going to happen as companies think about, you know, when you think about in the U.S., the CHIPS Act and how we're going to develop semiconductor production here and the impact that has on growth, you're going to see a fair amount of CapEx in a lot of these economies. And by the way, higher levels of persistent inflation because of the regionalization, the deglobalization of the economy. It's pretty impressive stuff that's, um, that's going to happen over the coming years. So the impact that China is going to have and the impact the U.S.-China relationship is going to be going forward has, uh, has major ramifications for, uh, for where we're going. Listen, we, we think China is going to grow this year. Our expectations is China is going to grow. We have a, a projection of 6.7%. It's a pretty big number. It's a mm -hmm. pretty impressive number. In, um, when you add that to the global economy. So, you know, I, by the way, you look at Chinese stocks every day, 
and um, the market is reacting to what is a pretty ebullient uh, potential growth coming over the coming weeks and or coming months and years. Do you think the China reopening story is what's kind of driving Europe also higher at this moment? I mean, so so yes, I think that Europe, you know, the expectation that Europe was going to be in somewhere between recession and deep recession was largely motivated by the fact that you were going to have a nat gas problem that was going to be persistent. And you had one of the greatest uh, lucky events of all time that you had this warm weather and nat gas inventory levels. You look where nat gas inventory levels are today in Germany. And you think about some of the initiatives to allow nat gas inventories to build, pretty impressive. And so now you're starting to get, I've been pretty blown away by the CapEx spend you're seeing in Europe. And one of the, one of the underlying catalysts for Europe going forward is renew, I mean, people underestimate renewable energy development, and it's actually been pretty incredible. Aviation demand has driven CapEx. So no doubt China is gonna motivate some of the growth in Europe, but I would say warmer weather, the depreciation of, uh, of fuel prices, and then some real CapEx that's going, you look at Siemens numbers, Atlas, Copco, uh, pretty impressive numbers that they're putting up that shows Volvo, mm -hmm. that shows some pretty good, uh, pretty good development there. We're going to come back to you with a question about high yield, but I want to ask Dennis a question. We've got a big meeting coming up next week. January 31st, uh, the Federal Reserve is meeting, first meeting of this year. Arguably, you are in the most interesting seat in the House, having sat through those meetings, having been uh, president and CEO of the Atlanta Fed on the FOMC. Man in the room, what is it like being in an FOMC meeting? Is it very formal? Does everyone have their, you know, kind of books in front of them? Or is it more a little bit more of like everyone kind of lays back and just chit chats about what they think about? Like, give us, give us the story. Well, we're all looking at our watch so we can get to the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I'd answer your question, Barbara, by talking about what's going on today and tomorrow. Please. Which is quite interesting. And then a couple of comments on the meeting itself. Um, this is the week before, and there's a lot of preparation that's going on in each reserve bank as well as the Board of Governors. On the Wednesday before the meeting, typically, or no later than Thursday, the staff sends out three draft statements. This is the statement that comes out at 2 p.m. on the second day of the meeting. And each one represents a different policy decision. So there's A, B, and C. And um, B typically has the fingerprints of the chair or the troika, which would be the chair, vice chair, uh, Leo Brainerd, and John Williams of the New York Fed. They're the core people who are trying to lead the committee to a consensus. And uh, as I said, the chair typically weighs in on the wording and the policy decision, obviously, that's embedded in at least alternative A. <clears throat> then uh, starting today and perhaps tomorrow, uh, Jay Powell will make telephone calls around to the different participants in the meeting, particularly the, the Fed presidents. He's talking to the, the governors in the hallways or in their offices in, um, in Washington. And those calls are to kind of get a sense of where people stand and what they're going to support. And maybe there's a little dialogue in which he tries to persuade fence sitters to go the direction he wants to go. Um, but they're very benign conversations so that he can do a little bit of a nose count and know if he's going to have any a problem with dissenters. Right, socialism. Socialize and there are, now we, there are fully 12 people voting on the committee. Um, the rule of thumb when I was there, we never, never quite got to 12 voters, but more than two dissents looks bad. It presents a picture to the world that you have a divided committee and that the, the committee really isn't uh, of one mind on what policy should be. That's probably uh, disconcerting to people in markets, I would think, if you say even the Fed can't make up its mind. So he, he's trying to feel out whether he's going to have some dissents. And he, most chairs, I think, will take two dissents 
but more than two begins to look a little bit bad. And then the meeting itself is relatively formal. Um, each of the 19 participants has an opportunity to speak at two times, one discussing the economy and the second uh, in support of and with comments on what the policy, policy decision would be. So there's the economy round and the policy round. Um, 19 people at the table, plus some staff people, probably about 60 people in the room, um, conducted in a very methodical, relatively formal way. Mm. Um, I took my own coat hook and put it over the back of my chair, took my coat off and hung it from the hook. And I'm sure there were people in the room who thought this was a sin against nature, you know, that you don't <laughs> take your coat off in an FOMC meeting. But uh, um, it, it's relatively formal, and therefore there's not a ton of back and forth debate. Mm. It's really more each person getting a chance to say something. And then, of course, it culminates with a decision that is made by noon of the second day so that there can be a press release at 2 p.m. and then the, the Powell press conference at 2.30. And one of my staff members at the Atlanta Fed said once, and I thought he had good insight, he said, this is not a system to get to a perfect consensus. It's a system to get to a decision. <laughs> and the Fed comes out with a decision every time. So uh, I sat at a very influential table tonight while we were having dinner, and this question is from Bill Annis. What's the terminal rate? Where is it? Is it at five? Is it at 5.25? Where do you yeah, think it I is? Told you, I, I told you I learned never to answer a question. <laughs> <laughs> Give us um, a ballpark. <laughs> I, I would say above five. Okay. And uh, as of now, the, what, we, what do we have to work with? We have the December. Summary of economic projections, which showed three more or two or three more moves of seven, total 75 basis points. So I think that's reasonable. I sense in taking in the Fed speak that they're beginning to feel they're close to a, a, a sufficiently restrictive stance mm -hmm. that they can let lie for a while yeah. and just l let it. Let the lags play, you know, the lag defects play through. So I don't think they're going on unless the data are bad this year. And, and as of now, the inflation data seem to be uh, very positive, I think, or at least headed in the right direction. But it will be data dependent. They'll keep going if, if the data turn negative. Rick, kind of in the same vein, you know, look, you run an organization that is arguably as influential to the financial markets as the Fed is to the global economy. You know, how does your team go about sourcing investment ideas? Do you have like a formal meeting every Monday morning? Do you have dozens of people that come in and just recommend things to you? Tell us how you source your investment ideas because that 800 basis points of alpha last year on strategic income opportunities, we would all give our left arm for that. <laughs> Well, I hope so, because it's definitely not going to happen this year. The, uh, <laughs> by the way, it's easier to lose less than it is to make more, I've learned in my career. The, uh, uh, so I'd say, by the way, can I pick up one thing that Dennis said Please. that I think is incredibly articulate and thoughtful about where we are today from an investment point of view versus where we were last year. When you think about, you know, for investing and anything we, we, uh, that we do in the investment world, when the risk-free rate is moving as much as it's moving. You get 475 basis point rate hikes down to a fit into a 50. Mm -hmm. And now we're debating, are they gonna go two more 25s, maybe another 25? And by the way, maybe they do another 25, as Dennis was saying. But you're talking about the risk-free rate being much more stable than we've seen by a lot. So rate volatility comes down. It allows you to do so many more things in the markets sell rate volatility by things like agency mortgages because their convexity is, is so much uh, easier to deal with in that environment. It is such, I think people underestimate, you know, when you go through this period, and by the way, when you get, when the rates move that much, you think about it, gosh, how do I hedge my portfolio? We were running, and part of I think how we did okay is we were running huge amounts of cash because the normal hedges like interest rates, not a good hedge, it's gonna hurt you worse 
the dollar wasn't a good hedge because it was on a one-way train higher. It wasn't, you know, being along it was, was okay, but you weren't getting any vol one way or the other relative to the economy. Uh, equity vol was too high to hedge. And all of a sudden now you're getting the risk-free rates down, vols coming down because we're approaching pause. It changes the paradigm of investing by an incredible amount. Anyway, I think this thing is a really big deal as, uh, as Dennis has described. So what, what do we do to source the investments? Listen, I think the first thing that's really important is you got to identify what's the regime you're operating in. And I think, you know, I think it's a lot easier if you, if you can get the regime right, which is not always easy or uh, ever easy, but if you get the regime right, then what falls out of it, so you think about today, we're in a more docile environment. So gosh, you know, how do we, how do we short rate vol, which is way too, which is very high relative to equity vol. Where do we go for that? And then we go to our teams, like what's the, you know, is it agency mortgages? Do you actually short vol uh, actively in the, in the marketplace? Where do we go for, gosh, if now, because the risk-free rate's so high, you can get yield at the front end of the curve without taking duration risk, credit risk, and liquidity risk, and you can capture four and a half with some spread to, to six. So then what we do is we say, okay, this is the opera, you know, we can get a lot of income in our portfolios now. We can hedge the risk. We don't have to sit in so much cash because we've got other tools. And then we go to our teams and say, okay, by the way, dollar more stable EM. And we go to our teams around the world and say, you know, what's the best expression when we think about our risk parameters, things like beta, dispersion, correlation risk. And then we go to our teams around the world and say, you know, what's the best if we want to fit this bucket of risk and then try and marry it into our analytics. But, you know, I think mobile, getting everybody on the same page around regime and then letting the teams figure out, you know, should we be top of the stack in commercial mortgages, go down to MES and let your teams operate. And that's, uh, you know, we're hugely blessed. Have a, we have a really, really good team around the world that uh, helps us with that. Barbara, if I could add, regime, yeah, regime is a good, a good uh, thing to, to, to organize your thinking around. Mm. Um, from a policy point of view, the first phase was catch up mm. and to get to neutral. The second phase was to get to restrictive. The phase we're entering now, either last meeting or this meeting, is a calibration of the endpoint of a rising rate cycle or a of a policy rate rise cycle. And th that's a little finer, more tactical, but it's not going to be nearly as dramatic as 475s. Right. I mean, yeah, look, we've all been in the business a collectively a long time. Um, it is, last year was shocking on just so many levels, right? It was shocking to see that the Fed was doing 75 basis points when for the better part of two decades we were used to 25 basis points and very consistent, easy messaging. You kind of knew what the Fed was going to do. It was a really big, wild ride last year. But you know, we think about, and this question is for both of you, we think about this kind of big um, mountain that we went through with the pandemic, right? You know, major shutdown to the economy, massive fiscal stimulus to restart it. You know, you went from inflation in asset markets to wages and now also into goods and services. We're coming down the other side of that. Inflation uh, across every single metric that you look at on three month rate of change, six month rate of change, even year over year, inflation is starting to come down. Once we get to the other side of the mountain and we're somewhere in the vicinity of two to 3%, what happens? Do we go back to secular stagnation? What's, what is the regime of the economy then? Well, you have to, at least as a starting point to answer the question, look at some fundamentals that are not terribly bullish from the point of view of the long-term growth prospects of the economy. Uh, the trend rate of growth or gr gr growth rate of potential is viewed as 1.8 percent, something like that. <clears throat> And today we had a 2.9% GDP growth number. So you're going to certainly get some strong quarters. But the fundamentals that, that I think are important to remember are demographics, the deteriorating dependency ratio in the country, the slow growth of the workforce, the political difficulty in getting anything done on immigration that would be a rational management of the inflow of workers into the country. Um, those are all factors that suggest that over this hill, or over this mountain, 
we might resume a slow growth kind of economy. Uh, because, it, and, and another factor is productivity growth. And this is a secular trend for, for two or three decades, but slow growth of productivity. So you either get your GDP growth from more workers or from more workers plus the productivity that they have. And if you get those going together, uh, you have a strong economy, but neither the demographics nor productivity growth, at the moment at least, are terribly encouraging. And the New York Times article over the weekend, I don't know if some of you I'm sure saw it, have talked about uh, science discoveries and the slowdown in major breakthroughs in the scientific world. That's part of the productivity question. Rick, what do you think? So I, mean, I, I agree with everything Dennis said. I actually think people underestimate how economies over the intermediate term follow the demographic curve with incredible sincerity. And if you think about you know, what's potential growth in Japan when you've got this extraordinary onerous demographic dynamic, you know, it's potential growth there can't be a lot higher than zero. By the way, China's going through what is a, what is a real significant aging dynamic. Listen, I think we're gonna follow the demographic curve exactly as Dennis said, and, and by the way, it's pretty hard, given where interest rates are and have gotten to, to get a big fiscal push from here going forward, like, like we just got over the, over the prior couple of years, few years. So I think we are going to a slower growth paradigm. And, I, and so, by the way, I think from the investment point of view, it's a really big deal when you think about if that's where we're going and you think about where we sit today, you know, with where the front end of the yield curve or where its interest rates are, you can build a portfolio in high quality assets and get you a six. You know, if you take you know, the one to three year part of the short end of the index, the ag is four and a half, put a little bit of spread on it, do a little bit of international swap back to dollars, you can create a six. If we're going back, which I think Dennis is 100% right, if you're going back to an economy that operates in and around two potential growth, you're gonna feel pretty good with a portfolio of six over the coming, and particularly if you can lock it in. You're seeing a lot of people today say, let me lock in these yields, and they're now pushing out the yield curve a bit because I'm going to lock in that because we're going back to a slower growth paradigm. The, the only thing that I would say that I am always crazy impressed with how technology takes us to the next level. And you think about the discussion, you know, Rich and I, uh, uh, at Piper, we're talking a lot about AI and this, and this chat GBT and how AI is going to take us to a different level of efficiency. I think there is some pretty extraordinary stuff going on. By the way, and, and you're going to get some capbacks that we talked about from energy development, et cetera. So I still think we're slowing, but I, but I think people underestimate there are some things that will keep us from, quote unquote, stagnating. Yeah, no, they, I think one, the automation is starting to. Yes. You know, I had a colleague in the Fed who used to like to say, we're the fastest horse in the glue factory. <laughs> so, so I don't want my earlier remarks to be taken as horribly pessimistic relative to other economies. Yeah. This economy has a lot of things going for it. And if you take the demographic challenge alone, China cannot really uh, absorb immigrants and assimilate them. Japan can't do that. Europe has its difficulties in that respect. The United States, at least potentially, could have a growing workforce if we can get some of the political problems solved. So, and the innovation in this economy is, is impressive. Maybe AI turns out to be another technological revolution that really catapults the economy. I, I wouldn't rule it out. You know, you were speaking about politics, Dennis, and it made me think of something that's not necessarily on everyone's mind today, but boy, it's gonna be by the summer. The debt ceiling. So what's the discussion like inside the Fed when you have an issue like the debt ceiling, right? Do they, what does the Fed think about it? What are they, can they do anything about it? Are there any back channels that they kind of get into uh, to kind of help things move along when quite frankly, some of our political representatives are having difficulty doing it? Well, the, 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 the Fed chair and the secretary of the treasury, Janet Yellen, so we, Powell and Yellen, get together once a week, and, and they talk about it, th their respective um, responsibilities and 
their perspective on the U.S. economy and share notes. I don't think either invades the other's turf in any particular way. In the Fed more, speaking more w broadly, this is a fiscal matter. Mm -hmm. And the Fed does not really publicly speak about fiscal matters, nor have I seen, in my experience, a lot of discussion within the Fed, except as something like a breach or a default, of a uh, breach of the debt ceiling or a default, would spill back into the domestic economy and become part of the Fed's sense that it has to try to manage the trajectory of the overall economy. But um, there's going to be very, it's very rare for the Fed to weigh in on fiscal matters. Um, there have been a couple of occasions in the past, but, but mostly it's because of the connection to the broad Main Street real economy and the Fed's sense of how it's going to evolve. You know, thinking about these types of things, Rick, like, you know, look, in 2011, it was a big event when U.S. debt was downgraded on one side. How do you think about things like that for your portfolio? How do you think about kind of blow-up events? And how do you, when you construct your portfolios, how do you think about making sure that some of these left-tail things that could happen, sometimes happen, that you're insulated against them, but you're taking enough risk that you're going to be able to deliver excess returns over your bench. Yeah, so in, you, so part of what you have to think through is what are the probability of the event taking place, and then what are the assets that it's going to impact. So if you think about where we are today, and you think about if we take ourselves down the road, you know, we got downgraded once from going down this road, you think about, people underestimate the status as, of reserve currency in the world accrues massive benefits to the U.S. economy. The thought that we would challenge that treasuries are the form of collateral in much of the world today. Mm -hmm. The idea that we would take that over the cliff is so, so crazy, so preposterous, that I still think today you have to assume that we're not going to get there. That being said, you've got a plan within your portfolio because I've seen over my career the craziest things that have, I mean, let alone pandemic, financial crisis, et cetera. So you've got a plan to make sure your portfolio is durable in that tail risk. So how do you think, how do you think about that? Hey, first of all, you know, I was fond in investing. You've got to think about the shark closest to the boat. And uh, today, <laughs> like, how are we going to get through? What's a payroll report going to be next week? But then you've got to have an eye on, do I have enough liquidity? Do I have enough hedges? And if I built for what is the intermediate term that this thing could be a problem because when people start talking about it or the fear of it starts to, uh, starts to become more intense and you've got to make sure your portfolio is durable with hedges attached to it. Like I say, today, would I put a tremendous amount of hedge on for that? Probably not, but as you get two to three months hence, and you've got to think about hedging it. And I've, and I've learned in my career, we're not in the business of being right, we're in the business of generating return for clients. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether the event takes place, if the markets start to believe yeah. there's a higher likelihood of that, then you've got to think about your portfolio is durable and you've got to generate return through that period when the markets are going to get anxious about it. Right. So like, what did you do, so just this was one that, you know, it's kind of close enough, but we're far enough away from it. What did you do in some period like with Brexit? Right? Were you were you putting in hedges in the portfolio back into U.S. dollars? Were you saying like, no, we're getting out of sterling? What did you, how'd you kind of hedge that? <laughs> well, first of all, I wouldn't say perfectly because we didn't think it would happen. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, that's in the world of rational things usually happen, and it didn't. Uh, but you, know, you got to think about, and you know, what we did is we we you know, plan around what is our currency exposure? How do we think about where our currency is? What do we have in terms of UK assets? Should we diversify our UK assets? So we start building and changing for that unlikely outcome. But I have to say, up until the day of, uh, by the way, you also learn about how inefficient polling is. Uh, in, uh, and so now I've given up on that as an indicator. The, um, but anyway, you have to plan for the, I mean, I spend, you know, we spend probably way too much time you know, hedging things. And I've learned over my career, you've got to you know, make sure you have appropriate hedges and then what is, you know, how far out of the money are those hedges? And so I'll never forget, we had a big hedge on, on sterling, and it was very far out of the money under the assumption that I don't want to give away the premium. 
And so, but if it hits, then it's gonna hit the out of the money strike. Yeah. And so we had one very big trade on that was all of a sudden hit the strike and uh, worked out really well for us. So going into things like debt ceiling, et cetera, yeah. you think about, you know, where are you not paying? Where skew work for you? Where you're not paying that much mm. for an out of the money hedge and then try and put that in the book and, and by the way, hope you lose money on it. I know, right? It's like basis points you're happy to give up. But you know, there's been a big development uh, really since probably the post TMT bus, but it's really gotten big through this uh, you know, zero rate policy that we had from the financial crisis really up until just a, a few, uh, up until just a year ago. And I'm curious, Dennis, how does the Fed think about so much of assets that have been flowing into the private markets? And then Rick, I want you to think about what does that mean going forward? So does the Fed worry about something like that? Because that could potentially hit U.S. pension plans, I would think, at some point, or financial stability. Well, financial stability is monitored very carefully. <clears throat> and there are at least semi-annual, and maybe quarterly, but I think semi-annual financial stability reports where they look at some of the things Rick referred to earlier leverage in the system, liquidity of major financial institutions. Um, I think there are four different categories of risks that they monitor carefully and, and then they try to grade these risks and come up with an overall sense of, of the financial stability risk. The Fed is also part, the chair attends uh, the FSOC meetings, the Financial Stability Oversight uh, Committee meetings, which are chaired by the, the Treasury Secretary and are run out of Treasury. And that's an opportunity to talk to a lot of the other bank supervisors and financial market supervisors and so forth and to compare notes and to come up with uh, some, we hope, some kind of common view of, of the risk. This is always being tracked and monitored. Um, I would say it's important to understand the Fed doesn't have much in the way of any proprietary data. They just have a lot of economists who are following the data and, and, and tracking it very uh, closely. So um, the Wall Street has the same data that yeah. the Federal Reserve has. Uh, for all practical purposes. Do you think the Fed's a little bit worried about the effects of QT on the liquidity in the Treasury market right now? Because liquidity is swinging around m meaningfully, right? And to some ways in not good ways. So what do you think the Fed could really do about that at this point? Or would they be willing to do anything about it? Well, there are two facilities, of course, that, that are overnight facilities, and the overnight reverse repo facility can be a liquidity provider, for example. Um, yeah, I, they have to be uh, concerned because a few weeks ago, I haven't picked it up in recent market uh, discussions, but a few weeks ago, there, there was quite a bit of concern about liquidity. I think their working assumption is that the QT may be on the margin contributing a little bit to liquidity strains, but it's not as important as, for example, foreign um, buyers or sellers of, of treasuries backing off from uh, the market. The, the balance sheet peaked at $8.9 trillion. It's $8.5 trillion today, so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not a, a lot of, of progress in shrinking the balance sheet. Yeah. So I think it's a little bit much to point at QT as the single Source. cause of any liquidity strains in the Treasury market. Hmm. So, Rick, private markets, boy, they've gotten a lot of assets. Not that BlackRock okay. hasn't, right? <clears throat> um, however, you know, there's a lot of money that has flowed into private credit, into private equity. Yeah. Everything is private. Yeah. How do you think that that affects the public markets, and what do you think it means for the private market returns going forward? So I think there's one thing that I, that I think, and Dennis alluded to this, you know, when, when monetary policy does its job, and, 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 and you think about what we had to go through, put tremendous liquidity in the system, and then you keep the funds rate at zero for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. I think people underestimate that what happens when you bring, when you keep the risk-free rate at zero, 
the marketplace has ROE targets, IRR targets, and you either get there organically through the yield or you gear it. You gotta lever it to get to those numbers. So when policy stays easy for that long, then all of a sudden you get the leverage build. And you've seen that play out in the private markets in a pretty extraordinary way. And it's part of why you're seeing commercial real estate that was geared um, come under the pressure. It's, it's come under, it's part of why you see this playing out now in resi, et cetera. But that gearing is such a big deal. The thing that I think is, is unbelievable today, as <clears throat> you think about the risk-free rate where it is, and you know, commercial real estate, CMBS, you know, the top of the stack AAA trades at six. It's pretty hard to lever a portfolio of commercial real estate when the top of the stack, when AAA is six. So what is gonna happen for the next couple of years? There's no question about it. The ability to lever equity, the ability to lever MES is going to slow slash stop mm -hmm. for things like commercial real estate. So the system will recalibrate. But you know, right now, I think you'll see or seeing this flood of money that will come into, gosh, get me a liquid five or six yield. You know, you think about pensions, endowments, if you have a 7% return target, if you can get six in the debt markets, five and a half to six, high quality, not a lot of beta, not a lot of illiquidity risk, not a lot of duration risk, there's a ton of money that's going in that way. And what it does is it'll mute the amount of private exposure or the private growth for, uh, for as at least a couple of years from now. Well, that's, look, that's an interesting environment, especially if you don't think there's gonna be a recession in, in 2023. But here's the question I have for both of you. No recession this year, that's great. But if you start to see the unemployment rate come up, does the Fed have to do something? Does the bond market just say cuts are going to get priced in? I need you both to help me on this one. You know, I think you'll never hear uh, Fed officials say this, but I think they would take a um, mild recession <clears throat> and in the SEPs they've shown where they think uh, the unemployment rate would be at year end, um, they would take a mild recession if it would really put the nail in the coffin of inflation. And um, I think they have tolerance for rising unemployment into the mid fours. Mm -hmm. And then you get into a, a, an environment in which they would really have to be, I think, weighing a little bit more of a trade off and look at the inflation numbers and the, the makeup of inflation, the, the, the sort of the underlying factors that are driving inflation and kind of come to a, a, a sense of whether that trajectory is going to continue toward target or not versus the speed and pain associated with rising unemployment. Mm -hmm. But right now, you know, th there's always a, a view that they should have, they should be symmetric around their goals, but right now, clearly inflation is a priority. Mm -hmm. And so you're asking a very good question, when does that flip? Uh, and how bad would it have to be for that to flip? That's exactly, how bad would it have to be? Rick, what do you think? So, so first of all, I'll say, I don't know, I've said at a bunch of client meetings and events today. I think people will be blown away how sticky employment is in this country. And you think about today, the claims number today was 186,000 jobs. The Fed's got the terminal rate to five. We're still at 186,000 claims, and we have an unemployment rate of three and a half, and we're creating over 200,000 jobs a month. There is still a dearth of, of people. You know, I've, I've argued you had this incredible retirement, people over 55. It's a third of the population in the country now. You've had this massive retirement, somewhat because they have wealth creation. There's not enough people for the jobs today. There's 822,000 jobs required still to get healthcare, leisure, accommodations, or, uh, hospitality, education to where it was. There is an extraordinary, you look at the job growth in the last three months, mm. it's a slowing economy around that. But there is still, we have a service-oriented economy that's not as interest rate sensitive, certainly education, healthcare. There's a dearth of, nur of nurses, managed care people that I just think is gonna keep going. So do I think the unemployment rate's gonna move up? I think it's gonna move up. I think it'll be slower than people think. But listen, I think as the year goes on, the economy slows. 
then I think you're going to start to see the forward curves react to that, and you'll start to get rates start to come down. But listen, I think we're going to be, I think, you know, thinking about a portfolio day and fixed income, are rates going to rally a tremendous amount when you've got a Fed on hold? And as Dennis said, it's got to focus on inflation. I don't think so. But if you can build carry, yeah. if you can build a lot of income, you can have a pretty good year, even if we're not on the other side of, of rates coming down. So you think it's still time that you could be in the dicier parts of the credit markets? Not really. I, I uh, you know, I, I, quite frankly, I think you're not, you're not getting paid mm -hmm. for being in high yield today. I mean, I, by the way, we own some high yield. I like European high yield better than U.S. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty extraordinary. So I'll give you an example. Double B high yield today trades at 660. We bought, Spain brought a, brought a $13 billion 10-year yesterday. You swap it back to dollars, you get close to six. So I could buy Spain. If Spain defaults, Europe has a problem. <laughs> If the high yield, if the economy slows, but the volatility of free cash flow into the high yield market, mm -hmm. you're just not getting paid. You've had this incredible compression yeah. of high yield mm -hmm. down to quality assets. And I'll tell you a good example of this. Agency mortgages that you can get in the fives, if you have, if mortgage rates stabilize to improve, you can get high single digit return mm -hmm. from buying the second most liquid asset after treasuries. Mm -hmm. I just don't think you're getting paid for, given the compression, particularly leveraged loans, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think you're getting paid for taking the risk today. I'd rather try and build a high quality six mm -hmm. than say, gosh, I need another extra 100 basis points to take credit risk when the economy is slowing. I just think some of those markets, because of the demand for yield, I don't think, I'd rather buy, take a lot more beta, up the stack, high quality, AAA credit card debt, AAA uh, auto, mm -hmm. prime auto, et cetera. You're just not getting paid for taking a lot of risk. By the way, emerging markets, I think, are now starting to become really intriguing. Mm -hmm. You know, if the dollar stabilizes, yeah. you know, you can get, if you hold local rates in max, you know, you're getting 10 for, you know, what is the beneficiary of, a, uh, of an economy that's going to be more regional, more North America. Yeah. There's some EM is more interesting with a dollar that's more stable today. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. So we have some microphones set up over the room, so we're going to have some Q&A. But before we go to Q&A, I have a question for both of you that's a bit more of a personal nature. We mm -hmm. have a lot of young CFAs in the society in Atlanta. What advice, from a career standpoint, would you give them so earlier in their careers, Dennis? Well, I gave a graduation speech once, and I said, there are no boring jobs if you improve what you touch. So that's my, my advice. Anything you touch, improve it. Love it. I mean, such an illustrious career. What great advice to give anybody who's early on. Rick, what about you? <clears throat> so, you know, I always think, and I think in this industry, you have a lot of people that are trying to get from point A to point B really quickly. I don't think people prepare enough for, uh, Chanel Frazier runs our Atlanta office and I were talking about, so there's a friend of ours named Paul Tudor Jones who has the most extraordinary ability to react to markets quicker than anybody I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I think he's one of, of one that can do it. Mm -hmm. I watch people that come in every day, they read, they read the paper online, uh, they, read, uh, they read superficial, they read research and say, and they watch the momentum of the markets and say, and then they come up with, this is the theme we're operating and this is, now it's a uh, soft landing theme, I gotta buy everything that's soft landing-ish. You know, I watch people, whether it's going to a client meeting, whether it's going into, you know, thinking about what am I gonna invest in tomorrow, what if the markets do this? And to me, I've always found that people that prepare, like I've got some people, that I'm honored to work with, or, um, and they're just always thinking about and they're spending time on the weekends preparing for anticipating what's going to happen. And I just think it's the whole industry is about if you're prepared and if you know, you're in the media and somebody asks you a question, did you think in advance what was that question going to be? Because you can answer eight questions right, and if the ninth stumps you, people are like, wow, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so I just think that, you know, I would say to young people, just prepare, think through what could happen. And I'm still amazed today that people think they could do it on the fly. And I've met very few people that can, that can do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, my career so far is proof of you cannot do it on the fly. Right? Yeah. You always have to prepare. So um, we're going to take just a few minutes for questions from the audience. So any questions that anybody has? And if not, Matt Toms will tell you. I'll start calling on you all, so you better get your hands up. <laughs> 
Can you hear me? Joe yes. Monica, Integritas Investment Management. This Excellent. is a question for both uh, guests tonight. Uh, embedded inflation, inflation expectations, other than the tip spread, where will we see a surprise at to capstone this decade of embedded inflation? Well, if I understand the question, <clears throat> which I'm not sure I do, but... Um, <clears throat> I was hoping you were going to go first. Let me... Let me, <laughs> let, let, me, let, me let me take the question and, <clears throat> and sort of paint a picture. Inflation expectations, other than tips, break-evens, have not really broken out to the high side in any dramatic way. They've gone up a little bit and they've receded a little bit in the surveys that are done periodically. So I think the overall picture is inflation expectations as a potential source of further inflation really is not in a dangerous territory. And I believe that's the way the committee views that question. Um, there is, however, in your question, I suggestion that for a, a decade we could be in an inflationary environment. And I don't dismiss that view, um, partly because of the tightness of the labor market and the fact that a secular trend of capital suppressing the bargaining power of labor, which has gone on for 40 years, seems to have, have flipped, seems to have changed. So the, Labor now has the bargaining power, and that could, could mean that for several years we're going to be seeing wage pressure that translates into inflationary pressures, at least in the service category. And, and so we could have a long-term inflation issue, if that's mm -hmm. part of yeah. your question. Thank so you. I, I was at a dinner. Uh, very much, you know, I'm being very speculative mm -hmm. here. I do think inflation is going to come down, but whether it comes down to something close to 2% is another question, I think. I, w I was at a dinner for uh, one of our research providers in October, or actually it was in late September, and uh, the dinner the night before, we had two gentlemen that worked at the New York Fed in the 1970s. And so we were kind of going around the table. Everyone is just panic-stricken about inflation at this point. They folded their arms and they said, you guys don't know it's like, we're gonna be in this, we're in 1972 all over again. And I leaned next to somebody, I said, do you think the peak is this month? And they're like, no, it can't possibly be. And it looks like like the rate of change had just started to crest at that point. So Rick, answer our question. So, so it's a couple of things. I wanna pivot over something that Dennis said. You know, I quite frankly think that you are, what Dennis said is, is unbelievably right around the movement from capital to labor. We're actually closing the income gap in this country today. Mm -hmm. We've tried for 20 years to close the income gap. You know, we talked about the lower income jobs in hospitality, healthcare, et cetera. All of the wage gains today, you see, by the way, all the layoffs are in the higher paying jobs, yeah. tech, finance. Yeah. I actually think it's really healthy. If net disposable income for the lower income strata stays high, I think the Fed should preserve that. I actually think it's actually helpful and it's closing the income gap. But I agree with, with what Dennis said. It's hard. Wages, I think, will stay, stay more elevated. And it does impact the service sector, which I think is hard to bring that inflation down. I will throw one other thing. You know, we've, uh, we talked about this before. We've had this incredible benefit of better weather. The inventory levels of energy are pretty low today, mm -hmm. away from nat gas buildup in Europe. I do think oil prices can migrate higher. You look at what's happening at copper today, you look at what's happening at some of the other metals. If you got China growing, mm. you could have this significant inflation stimulus coming from right. higher commodity prices again. But listen, to me the big one is, how do you bring down, and, and should you bring down, you know, I always think the trade-off today, like should we take two or three million people out of work or bludgeon the real estate industry if net disposable income, particularly for the lower income strata, you know, where you think about what the consumption basket is, food, energy, rent, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a really tough trade-off, I think, I think for the Fed, how to, th how to think through that. We have another question. Yes. Barbara, uh, uh, I'm Jeff Rosenzweig, because way to business school, international finance professor, 
Rick was one of our average students. It's really his wife. <laughs> that was a, that's an overstatement. It's really his wife that had the brains. <laughs> so randomly, we made him vice chairman of the investment committee. Um, but Allison Dukes for the Invesco people also uh, was one of our students. Uh, Barbara, you're right. The 1990s, you said, is probably when we had a minor recession. The only recession in the 90s, the 91 one, was very minor. Just a little bit afraid of Saddam Hussein. But my question is, Dennis, as you know, um, you've been interviewing people. We've been talking about the idea that the Fed is really saying we are probably going to have a terminal rate, uh, probably between five and five and a quarter, 5.1. And they're saying, and we're going to keep it. You know, we're not going to pivot. Uh, and um, Rafael Bras has said that. We've seen some others say it recently. And then the markets continually are saying, you know, by looking at, at the prices, oh, no, they're going to pivot. They'll be bringing it down within 2023. There's this dichotomy that continues. I was wondering if either of you had any insight into that. I think the markets are ahead of the Fed. And, and if I read the, the how should I put it, the, not the tea leaves, but I read the, uh, the commentary that you hear from Fed officials, I think as they see the world today, they have no intention mm -hmm. Of, of removing uh, the tightness of, of policy in 2023. Now, you always have to condition that on what happens with the data. You, know, you never know for certain what circumstances they're going to be facing. Let's, for, let's remember that this whole situation we're in is because of a shock, and we could have more shocks related to geopolitics or related to the debt ceiling or something that totally comes out of the blue that no one expected that changes the economic circumstances. So you can never actually say something with 100% assurance. But as I see the situation today, we're going, they're going to hold until they're very, very confident that the inflation rate is headed toward target and is, you know, within 100 basis points or 150 basis points of target. So three to three and a half percent, something like that, with a high likelihood that that trend is going to continue. That's the way I think they see the world. And that, that suggests to me they'll stay high longer than the markets are pricing in today. So I, so I agree with Dennis. The thing that I think is amazing, I've learned in my career, that if you have two tools, you have technicals and fundamentals. The thing I want to operate in, certainly in the short term, is the technicals. The fundamentals usually win, but it takes a long period of time. I think most people, Jay Powell, when he tells you they're not going to use in 23, I think you're supposed to believe they're not going to use in 23. Like Dennis says, they're going to sit there for a long time. The paradigm that's playing out in the markets, though, is extraordinary. The amount of money that's gone into money market funds is unbelievable. The cash sitting at households today is unbelievable. And you think about what just happened for the last year. People sat on their hands and redeemed and are now sitting on massive amounts of cash. So now what we're watching play out is people say, gosh, you know what, I can lock in. So the 20-year average for the one to three-year part of the ag, the front end of the yield curve, the 20-year average is about one in one, a little over one and a half percent. The last 10 years, it's 1.1 percent. Now you can buy the one to three year ag at four and a half. And so I think people are saying, you know what, I'm, you know, what is the one year, one year forward supposed to be? What is the two year, one year supposed to be? I don't really care. Four and a half get me a lot of that stuff because, you know, like Dennis says, the economy is going to slow and people have tons of money. And you think about what happened last year. I just want to sit in cash. I don't want to get bludgeoned yeah. by rates moving higher. There's a technical condition that is extraordinary. <clears throat> the money is now pushing out the curve and willing to take, you know, the probability, to, is the Fed going to ease? Probably not. But the, your break evens from buying a four and a half carry asset with a two year duration is so powerful. Mm. I'm not going to lose money on it. And maybe the Fed eases and I can make significantly greater return. I just think it's the technicals driving what is clearly a mispricing in the market. By the way, the same thing. How many times did Christine Lagarde have to say, you know, wake up, you're mispricing it. It's, uh, and it's right. And, I, and like I say, you don't meet many people in the market say, gosh, I really think the Fed's easing in 23. I just think it's a, it's a 
condition happening because the amount of cash and the money's going. Okay. And by the way, equities aren't that, it, you know, they're, we could debate where's the equity market going with earnings compressing with the economy slowing. So it's like, gosh, get me a four and a half to five and I'll, I'll talk about, talk, I'll talk with you about it again in six months. Excellent. Well, everybody, we're just about up on our time. We're going to leave it there. We've done some great work tonight with these two illustrious people to have on this panel. Let's give a big hand for Rick Reeder and Dennis Hunter. I'm sure someone from the society is going to come up here at this point. <laughs> but while we are, I'm going to give you one last minute question. You guys are all human beings. We got to see the professional side of you tonight. What are you watching on Netflix, Rick? Are we done? So, so I don't, I don't. Uh, oh, you, you watch something. You, no, you, I watch a lot of sports. You know the show I'm actually addicted to. I've been addicted to through COVID. Is uh, I don't know if I can say Shark Tank. I actually <laughs> find, I actually find the whole dynamic, so the entrepreneurial nature of it, and how that, and, you know, from being in markets for a long time. I don't know, I love, I love that show. I think the whole entertainment part of it is awesome. <laughs> Dennis, what are you watching? I'm binging on Fauda. I know, I'm sure there's some in, some in the audience who have been watching it. It's because just the fourth season just came on. Yeah. And it is an, an extremely well done series about a, an Israeli special unit that works on the West Bank and works uh, in the Palestinian territories extremely well done and I'm told that they, they originally didn't believe this was going to be successful with the Israeli population because they live this every day why would you come home and relive it on TV but it has been a uh, it's really been a, a uh, big success in is Israel a lot of subtitles but it's a fat hmm. oh thank you so much hmm. all right everybody thank you Thank you. Thanks, Dennis.